a position to discuss about the relations of the axillary artery. As you can see, this pink colored highlighted structure, this is the axillary artery. Don't worry, we'll get a closer look at that. Why I have such a panned out uh, view over here is to really give you an overview as to how the relations would probably look like, what the muscles all around are. And uh, you, as you can see, I have removed the pectoralis major over on the right side, whereas on the left side, we have the pectoralis major. Why I have done that is to compare both sides or rather compare the superficial relations. Obviously, both sides relations would be the same, but uh, compare and contrast. Really. So let's get started. So how we are going to deal with this? Let me first give you an overview. Firstly, we'll talk about the different parts themselves and their relations. OK, general relations like muscle relations, um, any veins or any other fascia or anything like that then specifically we will talk about the relation of the axillary artery with the brachial plexus now if you do not know about the brachial plexus um, although I would suggest that you get a little knowledge about the brachial plexus before you delve into the relations of the axillary artery with the brachial plexus or you can skip the brachial plexus relations for now and only concentrate on the other relations. However, if you are a little bit adept with the brachial plexus, just know your thing around. Although I would give you a bit of an overview, don't worry. Um, then I would say that you would be in a position to really understand the relations of the brachial plexus with the axillary artery. So that is a section that we'll be concentrating on after we have finished the general relations of the axillary artery. So without further ado, let's really start. So the first part of the axillary artery, as you can see, first of all, this is the pectoralis minor muscle. Okay. So this part is the third part of the axillary artery, the part which is behind second part and this part, this is the first part of the axillary artery. Now, first part of the axillary artery. What are the anterior relations for that? See, anterior relations for almost all the parts of the axillary artery, they remain for the most part the same. Because obviously anteriorly throughout you will have skin, you will have the superficial fascia for the pectoral and the upper limb region. You will also have the deep fascia, which in case of the um really pectoral region it is a pectoral fascia the pectoral fascia which is the fascia covering the pectoralis major that constitutes for the deep fascia of this region anyway so superficial fascia deep fascia pectoralis major itself again will be a superficial relation or rather an anterior relation why because as you can see this is a pectoralis major so if the pectoralis major had been present you would not have been able to see the axillary artery. That's why I have removed it. But obviously, you can understand why it is the anterior relation. Obviously. So, these are more or less the general relations, which will always be like constant for all the parts. Now, let's get on with a little specific things for the first part. So, look very carefully. Let's first start with the muscle over here this muscle this is known as the platysma muscle and as you can see this platysma muscle this will constitute for first part of axillary arteries anterior relation why you can understand this obviously from the model right platysma again if you do not know about it no problem it is one of it is a constituent of the or rather it is an example of uh, paniculus carnosus which is superficial or skin or cutaneous muscles muscles which have um, attachments to the skin which are few in the human body but are plentiful in other mammals so platysma is something that we'll talk about in the neck anatomy region or i think we've already talked about it yeah i <laughs> i have discussed it on my channel already but anyways if you're new to anatomy Upper limb is the first domain, then no problem. You will talk about or you will learn about it later. 
So that's the first part of axillary arteries anterior dilation platysma. Now, I talked about the pectoralis major, right? Pectoralis major has two parts. One part is the clavicular part. The other part is the sternocostal part or the sternal part. Obviously, as the name suggests, sternal part originating from the sternum, the manubrium sterni, the actually the oblique aponeurosis of the external obliques as well. So it has a very extensive origin and it, it is larger of the two parts. Clavicular part, obviously, as the name suggests again, originates from the clavicle. Anterior aspect of the medial half of the clavicle, we know that. It is the clavicular part which is the anterior relation for the first part of axillary artery. And again, it is pretty self-explanatory because, see, this is the clavicle over here. Faintly, you can see it. So clavicular part will be the anterior relation for the first part of axillary artery. Now, remember I was talking about a fascia, the clavipectoral fascia. Remember that? Fascia, fascia, whatever. So this clavipectoral fascia, this will also actually encapsulate the pectoralis minor muscle along with the subclavius muscle and will be an anterior relation for the first part of the axillary artery. So this over here is the pectoral fascia, which I was talking about, the deep fascia of the chest region. The pectoralis major is covered by this pectoral fascia. If I hide this, we come on to another fascia, which is the clavipectoral fascia. Clavipectoral fascia is a, uh, it's a small topic, but it's pretty important actually. So it actually encapsulates, as you can see, the pectoralis minor. And it is also, when we'll talk about the axilla, we will know this. It, an extension of the clavipectoral fascia is known as the suspensory ligament of axilla. So it actually holds the posterior wall of the axilla. Again, not a problem right now. So what I'm only trying to say here is that, as you can see, this is this should be one of the anterior relations for the first part of axillary artery. Over here, it has been cut. No, okay, here. Yeah. Okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. So this is one of the anterior relations. Okay. Okay. Now. I'll show you, or rather I had talked about a few structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia, remember? These structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia, we can already see one of them, the thoracoacromial artery, over here, As, okay, this over here, see, the thoracoacromial artery, it is piercing the clavipectoral fascia, but there are a few other structures as well, for that we will see a diagram. See, this over here is the clavipectoral fascia. This is a very, very good diagram from Netter's Atlas. So, the thoracoacromial artery piercing the clavipectoral fascia. In the same region, there is another vein which pierces the uh, clavipectoral fascia and enters deep. This is known as a cephalic vein. This will be a topic of discussion, separate topic of discussion. Cephalic vein is also one of the structures which pierces the clavipectoral fascia. Another structure over here, it actually has been shown in this yellow. This is one of the nerves actually. This nerve which pierces the clavipectoral fascia, this is the lateral pectoral nerve. Okay. The lateral pectoral nerve, this also pierces the clavipectoral fascia to come out and actually supply the pectoralis major and minor. Brachial plexus branch, talk about it later. So, what I'm, why I showed you this diagram of why I'm talking about structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia is because these structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia are all piercing them or rather piercing the fascia at a common point somewhat and this common point is anterior to the first part of axillary artery. So all these structures that I just now talked about, they are anterior relation for the first part of axillary artery along with the clavipectoral fascia itself. Okay, so that completes the anterior relation. Now, 
what about the posterior relations for the first part see as you can see over here the first part is actually crossing the ribs and within the ribs there is obviously we know a muscle called the external intercostal so very specifically speaking the posterior relation for the first part of axillary artery will be the first intercostal space along with the external intercostal muscle although in this model it has been shown to be both first and second intercostal spaces but in the textbooks i have seen it written that it is a first intercostal space with the external intercostal muscle only so actually it might vary a little bit i guess or this model might be wrong anyways all we need to understand is that first or the first two intercostal spaces along with the external intercostal muscle that is a posterior relation along with that there is another very important muscle over here as you can see if i highlight this over here is the serratus anterior muscle very very important the serratus anterior muscle it has it actually originates via digitations right we know this so the first two digitations they actually constitute for this is the axillary artery's first part first two digitations they are the posterior relation for the axillary artery's first part okay so that is the general relations now there is actually another relation but that is a brachial plexus relation so we'll talk about it in a little time wait let's say first finish this part and then we'll talk about it then um, there is a lateral relation as well but again lateral relation is for brachial plexus so we'll leave it for now we'll come back to it in a bit medial relation now medial relation for that we need the vein because throughout the entire extent of the axillary artery the axillary vein will be always a constant medial relation very very important in fact, the first part of the axillary artery, it is actually encapsulated with the med uh, axillary vein and the brachial plexus. These three structures, the axillary vessels and the brachial plexus together, in the first part at least, they are encapsulated in a common sheath known as the axillary sheath, which actually is uh, a derivative of the prevertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia which we'll talk about in the neck anatomy region. So, um, that is a medial relation. And that more or less completes the first part. Second part, let's move on to the second part. Again, second part, medial relation, obviously, axillary vein. There is, or rather, there are other relations, medial relations for the second part as well. Let's, okay, let's remove the pectoralis minor so that we get a better look at the second part. So, this is the second part, right? So, again, brachial plexus is very well related to the second part as well, but we are ignoring that for now. Medial relation, again, axillary vein, no problem with that. What about the anterior relation? Anterior relation, again, the same things, skin, superficial fascia, deep fascia, pectoralis major and in this case pectoralis minor as well obviously right what about the posterior relation again posterior relation we have brachial plexus but there is a muscle which is related posteriorly as well if you see this is the muscle that i'm talking about this is the subscapularis muscle the subscapularis when we'll talk about the axilla we will come to know that the subscapularis along with the uh, rather along with other two muscles which we will come to know in the third part of axillary artery relations these three muscles will actually constitute the posterior wall of the axilla so it makes sense that they are the posterior relations for the second and third part of the axillary artery okay but for the second part only the subscapularis the other two muscles, which is, uh, let's break the suspense over here. This muscle, that is teres major. And this muscle, that is latissimus dorsi. 
these three muscles subscapularis teres major and latissimus dorsi these are the three muscles from the superior to inferior aspect they are the posterior wall of axilla but superiorly second part of axilla only subscapularis is related posterior when we'll talk about the third part of axilla in the first part there will be subscapularis and in the lower part there will be these two muscles so the third part of the axillary artery will be related to all the three muscles of the posterior wall of axilla i hope i am making sense over here all right i hope this makes sense anyways that's a posterior relation for the second part what about uh, lateral relation lateral relation again there is brachial plexus but along with that there is this muscle this is the coracobrachialis muscle right here coracobrachialis itself um, is not visible really but i have removed the biceps from here but the biceps brachii and the short head of the biceps brachii that actually um, really hides the coracobrachialis i have removed them so the coracobrachialis is pretty visible and as you can see this is the second part and this side is the lateral side right this side is the lateral side this side is the medial side so the lateral relation is a coracobrachialis that completes the second part as well third part third part of axillary artery so which part would be the third part see how you can know this even without uh bringing out the pectoralis minor see i can see that this is a branch coming off from over here so this must be the lateral thoracic artery see and what i had mentioned is that the lateral thoracic artery comes out from the lower border of the pectoralis minor so this must be the ending for the second part and this must be the third part over here so now we are in a position to really talk about the third part this entire part so if i remove the coracobrachialis we'll have a even better view this entire thing is a third part until 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 this is the teres major right so from the lower border of teres major onwards this becomes the brachial artery okay so this is the third part the last part of the axillary artery so again the anterior relations not really much to talk about skin superficial fascia the deep fascia again there will be the pectoralis major because pectoralis major is a pretty extensive one right but in the anterior relation of the third part we have a nerve as well which we'll talk about in the brachial plexus section okay okay now third part of axillary artery a very interesting thing about that is it is intimately related with brachial plexus so there are not there is not much to talk about as far as general relations are concerned again the posterior relation i had already talked about in the first part there is subscapularis in the later section there is uh, teres major with latissimus dorsi this is teres major and this is latissimus dorsi okay and this is subscapularis lower part the lower part of the subscapularis in the upper upper section of the third part of axillary artery will be related posteriorly and these two muscles they will also be related posteriorly to the third part okay okay now we move on to the lateral so i just now removed the coracobrachialis so the coracobrachialis that is actually a lateral relation just like the second part of axillary artery i hope i don't have to bring it back to show you pretty self explanatory right that is more or less the relation general relation of the third part of the axillary artery now without further ado i hope you understood all the muscles and all the uh, vein and all the you know fascia and all of that i hope the general relations are clear to you now finally we will move on to the brachial plexus relations for that i need this diagram i could not explain the brachial plexus relations in the model itself the reason for that is uh, that it's not really very accurate in the model but this diagram from bd chaurasia i think it's pretty simple and it's pretty easy to understand at least for the beginner section people who are who don't really have a depth knowledge about the brachial plexus for them it's pretty self explanatory 
now we finally have the brachial plexus relation so now let's start from the first part again and don't worry uh, it's pretty simple so now listen to me very carefully um, if you don't know really about the brachial plexus, first you need a little knowledge about that. But I hope you know a little bit about the brachial plexus to know that brachial plexus has a medial cord, a lateral cord and a posterior cord. Okay. I hope you know this. And later on, these cords, they will divide to give branches. The branches are the real nerves. So the real thing to actually know here, again, there is not much to memorize. But there is a lot to know anatomically. First part and the second part. Second part is a heaven, by the way, for brachial plexus relation. Second part is the easiest. I'll tell you why in a bit. First part and second part, they are related to the cords of the brachial plexus. Whereas the third part of the axillary artery, that is actually related to the branches of the brachial plexus the first part okay how i remember the brachial plexus how i personally remember the brachial plexus relations for the first part again you can just memorize before the day of the examination you can just memorize and go and you'll be fine but how well can you assimilate that's all that i i'm really trying to go for here how you actually imbibe this knowledge is i remember only one thing about the brachial plexus relation for the first part of the axillary artery, I try to think that the brachial plexus is a little superiorly or a little laterally shifted. I remember only this. By remembering only this one fact that the brachial plexus for the first part is a little laterally shifted, I can say that the medial cord, which would otherwise had been a medial relation becomes a posterior relation. Whereas the posterior cord, which otherwise would have been a posterior relation, becomes a lateral relation. Whereas the lateral cord, which otherwise would have been a lateral relation, remains a lateral relation because you have shifted it laterally. So lateral cord relation becomes more lateral. So do you get me? Do you, un do you understand what I'm going for? Medial cord becomes a posterior relation for the first part. Why? Because we shifted the brachial plexus laterally. We shifted it laterally towards this side. So instead of being medial relation, it became the posterior relation. Instead of the posterior one being the posterior relation, it became the lateral relation. And the lateral cord, as you shifted it laterally, it remains lateral. So it is a lateral relation. So this is the relationship of the first part second part now very simple medial cord is the medial relation posterior cord is a posterior relation lateral cord is a lateral relation do you know why this simplicity is or rather why the simplicity actually exists this is because the cords of the brachial plexus are named in accordance to their relations to the second part of the axillary artery so this is pretty convenient for us. You're saying lateral cord. You're saying medial cord. Posterior. Lateral to what? Medial to what? Posterior to what? The answer to that what is the second part of axillary artery. Second part of the axillary artery. Okay. So the relations are very simple for the second part. Third part. Now, finally, Third part is where the cords have divided into branches. So you need a little knowledge again about the branches of the different cords. But the, um, you know, just to put it very simply, the lateral cord branches more or less are the lateral relations. Posterior cord branches are more or less, the terminal branches at least, they are the posterior relations. And the medial cord branches are the more or less, the medial relations. So we know that the lateral cord, it actually gives the lateral branch or the lateral root rather of the median nerve. So that is a lateral relation for the third part. It also gives the musculocutaneous nerve, which is also a lateral relation for the third part. 
medial root of the medial nerve. Remember, I had said that there is an anterior relation for the third part of axillary artery. That anterior relation as far as brachial plexus is concerned for the third part of axillary artery is the medial root of median nerve. Medial, median. The nerve is median, root is medial and lateral. Okay. Do not get confused in that. What is happening here again, anatomically you should be very sound to understand this, that the lateral cord remains or rather the lateral root remains lateral. But the medial root of the median nerve actually crosses the third part of axillary artery to reach the lateral root and form the median nerve, which by the way, median nerve by the way, how is that related? That is related laterally. So the median nerve itself becomes a lateral relation for the third part of the axillary artery. Medial root of the median nerve becomes an anterior relation for the third part of axillary artery. Whereas posterior cord, it has two major terminal branches. The radial nerve, which is a posterior relation for the third part and the axillary nerve. Where is the axillary nerve over here? Okay, they, I don't think they have shown it. It should be over here somewhere. Um, I don't think they have shown it actually. Anyways, so the axillary nerve, that also is a posterior relation because it is a branch from the posterior cord over here. So posterior cord gives the radial nerve and the axillary nerve. It gives other branches as well, but these are the two terminal branches and they are the posterior relation for the third part. Brachial plexus relation I'm talking about. What about the medial relations? Obviously, axillary vein would always be there, but we're interested in the brachial plexus relations. So, medial cord branches, they are more or less the medial relations, except the medial root of medial nerve, which is an anterior relation. Okay. So, what are the branches more or less? We have the ulnar nerve over here. As you can see, this is the ulnar nerve. So this is one of the relation, medial relations. We also have this branch, which is the medial cutaneous nerve of forearm. As you can see, the medial cutaneous nerve of forearm and the ulnar nerve. These two nerves are situated in between the axillary artery and the axillary vein. Whereas there is another branch, which is the medial cutaneous nerve of arm. This branch it is also a medial relation of the third part, but more importantly, this is actually medial to the axillary vein as well. Whereas these two, ulnar nerve and the medial cutaneous nerve of forearm, they are lateral to the ulnar or they are lateral to the axillary vein. So these three, ulnar nerve, medial cutaneous nerve of forearm and the medial cutaneous nerve of arm, they are more or less the medial relations for the third part of the axillary artery. So that completes the entire relations of the axillary artery. We talked about the brachial plexus relations separately. We talked about the general relations over here in this model. First, we gave a general overview of the axillary artery, its different parts, the branches of the different parts, and then the different relations and all of that. So I think we have done more than enough for this discussion and without making this video any more longer i guess thank you very much and i hope to see you soon in another discussion thank you